Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this video, we are going to talk about the equations of motion and especially looking at motion in one dimension. So we can go ahead and get started here and let's take a look at our notation that we'll use. And for our problems here, we will take the initial time to be zero. So we are it's like working with a stopwatch, you start at time zero, and the ending time is just the same. So normally we define delta t the change in time to be the final time minus the initial time. So if the initial time is zero, this goes away. So the delta t is just your time time. We also often will drop the f subscripts for the final values. So the change in x is x, which is meant to be the final position, minus the initial position. So that would tell us our displacement, our change in velocity, velocity minus initial velocity. And we are going to assume constant acceleration in these cases, which allows us to avoid calculus in the problems. So the average velocity a with the bar over it is equal to the acceleration, which is a constant. So let's go ahead and look at the kinematic equations that we'll be using and do a few example problems with them. So our first set of equations are involved solving for the displacement and final position. So what we're looking at is our first equation says that the position, the final position is equal to the initial position plus the velocity, average velocity times the time where our average velocity here is given by the average of the velocity, the initial and the final velocity. Now again, this works for our constant acceleration example. It gets more complex in other cases. So these are the first two of our kinematic equations that we'll be using. And let's look at some exa an example here. And our example involves a jogger running with an average velocity of four meters per second for two minutes. And what we want to know is the jogger's final position. So as we start off with this, first thing we want to do is draw a sketch as we see here. It doesn't have to be fancy or artistic, but just something to put things in perspective. It always helps to draw this and to show what you're looking for. So in this case, we have the initial position. We have the final position, which is what we're looking for. And we mark the velocity as a vector moving towards the uh, right hand side at four meters per second. So the next thing we can do here is let's identify our equation. We'll keep our image on the screen in the upper right hand side to refer to. And our equation that we're looking at to find the final uh, position here is the, is given as the initial position plus the average velocity times the time. Now the next thing you want to do is to put down the values that you know. So what things are given in the problem. Sometimes you'll need all of them. Sometimes you won't need them. But it's always a good idea to write these down. So we know our average velocity. We know our change in time and we know our initial position, which we define to be zero. So we're starting at the zero point there. Now, the first thing we have to do is we have to note that one of these numbers is not in SI units and that would be minutes. We need to first convert the minutes into seconds. And we can do that because we know how many minutes are in a second and there are 60 seconds in each minute. So two minutes. If we set up our little uh, conversion here, we can then cancel the minutes and convert this to seconds and find out that there are 120 seconds in one in two minutes. Now, of course, we do may have known that off the top of our head, but we still want to see the procedure as to how we'd go through this. Then we can put our numbers in to the equation. So let's enter our values into the equation. We have the initial position of zero, which goes in here. We have the velocity of four meters per second here. And we have the time, which was two minutes, converted to 120 seconds, which goes in at the end. And then the next step is to complete the calculation and we'd find that our position would be 480 meters. And again, with the significant figures, we've been given three significant figures in each number. 
Uh, some things again are exact like 60 seconds in a minute. So our final answer will have three significant figures, which is why we add the decimal point here to clarify that that zero is significant. So let's go ahead and look at our second kinematic or third kinematic equation here which is solving for the final velocity initial velocity final velocity is equal to initial velocity plus acceleration times time and again we're considering constant acceleration if acceleration is not constant there are a couple things we can do we can break our equation down or our problem down into steps in which each section has constant acceleration or roughly constant acceleration otherwise we need to get into calculus to be able to solve some of these so let's go ahead and work an example with this equation and we're looking at an airplane landing. It has an initial velocity of 70 meters per second and decelerates at 1.5 meters per second squared for 40 seconds. How fast will it be going at that time? So as always, we start with our sketch. So the velocity is 70 meters per second in the positive x direction. The acceleration, because we are decelerating, we know that the the acceleration will be opposite to the direction of the velocity. And that means it will be to the left and that makes it negative. So we will have a negative acceleration. And then we can put here velocity final. How fast is it going? Is it enough to slow it down and stop it? Or is it even more and is it back and going in the opposite direction, which could happen in this case. So we'll have to see what the problem works out. And what we're going to find, let's go on to our calculation here. And again, put down your unknowns. We know the initial velocity, 70 meters per second. We know the acceleration at negative 1.5 meters per second squared. And we know the time at 40 seconds. And again, in this case, we are in SI units already. So there's no conversions that need to be done. And we need to consider what is our unknown? Well, we are looking for the final velocity. That is what we're going to try to figure out. So let's go ahead and use our equation here. So equation for final velocity is the initial velocity, which we have here, the acceleration, which we have, and the time, which we have here. So we can go ahead and put those into the equation and find out that the velocity is equal to 70 meters per second plus the negative 1.5 meters per second squared times 40 seconds. Now we can see what units will cancel here and what we'll see is that our seconds one seconds will cancel so that we will be adding meters per second to meters per second. So it makes sense you don't want you can't add a velocity to a distance or a velocity to an acceleration. You can only add velocity to velocity. So if your units don't cancel like that you know that you might have something wrong there. And if we go ahead and then calculate what we have, we find that our velocity is 10 meters per second. It is a positive value, so that's plus 10 meters per second, meaning it is still moving to the right, but at a slower rate. It was moving at 70 meters per second. After 40 seconds, it's down to moving 10 meters per second. And if the engines kept going, you could slow it to a stop. And if the engines continued going after that time, it would begin moving to the left. So you can actually do a calculation that would show. But what we're seeing here, the negative acceleration means that our final velocity is less than the initial velocity. So our next equation will show us when we're solving for a final position, when the velocity is not constant. So our velocity is changing. What happens if the velocity is changing? It's not quite as simple as when we use the average velocity before. In this case, we have a non-zero acceleration. So the first part of this equation may look familiar. The, the final position, initial position, plus the velocity times the time. However, if the excel so if the acceleration were zero, this term would go away and you could then just use the basic equation. But if the acceleration is non-zero, then we need this next term. And you can go through if you want to look into the textbook, you can see how this is actually determined. 
So let's go ahead and look at an example using this equation. And in this case, we're going to look at a dragster accelerating at 20 meters per second squared for 5.56 seconds. And how far does it travel? So we have our position, initial position, final position is what we're looking for. And we know the acceleration. So we can go ahead and start with again, let's put this up to the upper right hand side and look at what we know here and put our known terms in we know for a dragster that the initial velocity is going to be zero so it starts out at rest it accelerates at 26 meters per second squared for 5.56 seconds so those are the terms that we know what is our unknown well we don't know x we're looking for the final position here is what we want to find so let's put our equation down that we know and that is our current kinematic equation. And we know many of these values. We know that, for example, the, the initial position and initial velocity are 0. So what does that mean? Well, that means that this term and this term simply go away. They're both 0. So the final position is given by 1 half a t squared. And we'll see that here. And then what we need to do is to put our values in. So we know the time that goes in for t squared. We know the acceleration in here. One half of is, of course, just a constant. And if we put those numbers in, we can put our numbers together and then we can solve our equation, canceling the second squared, meaning we will get an answer in meters. So again, it is always important to look at the dimensions. Make sure your dimensions come out right. If you were getting meters per second here, that tells you something's wrong. But in this case, you're canceling two seconds here, two powers of seconds and two here, and then the seconds go away leaving us with just meters. And in fact, our final answer would be 402 meters. So that is how far this dragster would travel in 5.56 seconds. Now, we can do another example with this. So in our next kinematic equation, what we're going to be looking at is solving for the final velocity when the velocity is not constant, or again, the acceleration is non-zero. And in this case, what we can find is that the square of the final velocity is equal to the square of the initial velocity plus 2 times the acceleration times the displacement. So how far it's moved. So let's go ahead and do an example with this one. And what we see is we want to use that same dragster from the previous problem. But we're going to calculate the final velocity without using the time. So what if we were not given the time, but just knew what we had? So our sketch is still essentially the same. And we'll move that up, put down what we know. The initial velocity is zero still. The displacement we calculated at 402 meters from the previous problem. And the acceleration is still 26 meters per second squared. Now, we unknown is the final velocity, and we know our equation here. We know the initial velocity is zero. We know the acceleration is 26 meters per second squared. And we know that the displacement is 402 meters. So we can substitute those numbers in and then do the calculation to find that the v squared is 2.09 times 10 to the fourth meters squared per second squared. Now that's the square of the velocity. We have to take the square root of that then to get the velocity. And we would find that our velocity is then 145 meters per second. So that would be the velocity after the acceleration over that distance. So here we were able to solve for the velocity without even knowing the time because we knew the acceleration and we knew the displacement. Now we did need the displace need the time to get the displacement in the first place. But depending on what information you're given, it depends depends on what exact equation that you're going to use. So let's look at our kinematic equations and put them all together for you here. A good idea to keep these together for you. So there are various things to 
depending on whether you are solving for displacements in the first and fourth equations and velocities in the second, third and fifth equation. So depending exactly on what you're looking for, and you may also have to rearrange these equations. There could be cases where you know the displacements, but you want to find the times. So you may have to rearrange these equations to solve for things like time or acceleration as well. Now I've gone over some of the problem solving strategies that we use, but let's summarize them here as well. First of all, the most important things when you're starting on any of these problems is to examine the situation you're given and draw a simple sketch. Again, just little arrows or boxes are sufficient for this. Just something to give you an idea and try to focus as to exactly what you're looking at. You want to make your list of what is known. So write down all the known values. Again, you may not need all of them. You may only need some of them. But whichever ones you do need, you'll have them all there organized. Figure out what needs to be determined. It doesn't if you don't know what you're trying to solve for, you're going to have trouble. So figure out what you are trying to solve for in this and look for the equation or equations that you may need to help you solve the problem. Substitute into that equation the values that you know. Check your units. Always look to make sure if you're looking for a distance that you get a value in meters and not in meters per second. So if your units aren't right, then you can tells you immediately that something may be amiss. And then finally, is your answer reasonable? So if you find end up finding somebody uh, running and you get their speed in meters per second and you convert it and find out that they're running at a rate of hundreds of miles per hour, then it's definitely a not a reasonable answer. So you always want to consider if the answer could be reasonable as well. Does it make sense in a physical sense? So let's go ahead and finish up here as we do with our summary and what we've looked at this time were the kinematic equations that we can use to solve a number of problems in one dimension. In these cases we are assuming that the acceleration is constant and we can use the problem solving strategies that we discussed to solve various problems in physics. So that concludes this lecture on equations of motion. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day everyone, and I will see you in class.